In September of 1944, the Allied armies were advancing fast towards Germany. But a huge obstacle stood in their way. The River Rhine. An audacious plan to capture eight of the bridges across it in one fell swoop started well. But everything went disastrously wrong with the final quarry. The bridge at Arnhem. Twelve thousand airborne troops came by glider and parachute to fight for the bridge. It was the biggest airborne assault ever. But it didn't work. In fact, it would turn out to be one of the biggest disasters in the entire war. Of the 12,000 men who came here, only 3,900 got out again. However, the battle produced some of the most astonishing feats of bravery in British military history. One of the men fighting here was Major Robert Kane of the South Staffordshire Regiment. He arrived in the war zone by glider on September the 18th, just another ordinary man who'd given up his ordinary job to fight in the war. But 10 days after his glider landed in this very field, this ordinary man would have done something extraordinary. He would have won the world's highest award for valor, the Victoria Cross. It is almost impossible to win a VC. In the 150 years since it was created, the number of British and Commonwealth troops who've seen action is in the tens of millions. But only 1,351 of them have been awarded the Victoria Cross. The chances of surviving a VC action are just one in 10, but if you do survive, the medal can never be taken away from you. You can go to the gallows wearing it. And no matter how many letters you have after your name, VC always comes first. The VC, to my mind, has a place above all other national awards. It is the highest regarded award for gallantry. People have it in their minds that the Victoria Cross is something special, and anybody who's got the Victoria Cross must be somebody special. And they're right. I could have centred this programme on any VC winner. All of them are remarkable. But the most special for me is this man, Robert Kane. This, then, is his story. But it's also the story of the medal that he won. In official speak, the military say the Victoria Cross is awarded only for gallantry of the highest order. But what does that mean? Well, let me give you a typical example. This is the story of Lieutenant Ferdinand West, an RAF pilot who won his VC in the First World War. On August the 10th, 1918, West was flying his biplane far over the enemy lines when he was attacked by seven German aircraft. At the start of the fight, one of his legs was blown off by an explosive bullet and fell into the controls. West lifted his leg clear of the controls and, although wounded in the other leg, manoeuvred his machine so that his rear gunner was able to get several good bursts into the enemy aircraft and drive them off. All seven of them. 
Through sheer grit and determination, West then landed his plane safely, and although rapidly weakening and semi-conscious from the loss of blood, insisted on filing his report on the enemy troop positions before receiving medical attention. And the extraordinary thing is, the report here filed by his rear gunner said that he didn't know that the pilot had been wounded until after they landed. West never thought to mention that his leg had been blown off. The story of the VC began 150 years ago when Britain was in the thick of another empire-building dust-up, the Crimean War. There was huge bravery, but the system for rewarding this gallantry was a shambles. The medals that did exist were only for officers of a certain rank. There was nothing for the common man. Sometimes an ordinary soldier would be mentioned in dispatches, but that was no good because army commanders tended to list everyone who'd taken part. It was a bit like passing your chartered accountancy exams today. You get your name in the paper, but so does everyone else. The Crimean conflict, however, saw the advent of a new weapon to fight the cause of the foot soldier, the war correspondent. One of them was William Howard Russell from The Times. His stories from the front line meant that for the first time, people back home could read accounts about the immense bravery of the bloke next door. One of the people who read these reports was Captain Thomas Scoble, an MP who proposed a motion in the Commons on December the 19th, 1854, that the Queen should create some kind of medal, an order of merit, he said, for distinguished and prominent personal gallantry, to which every grade an individual, from the highest to the lowest, may be admissible. Unfortunately, the idea met with strong resistance from army commanders. They argued that the success of the British Army was based on the discipline of its formations. And they didn't want a medal that recognised individual acts of heroism in case it encouraged soldiers to break ranks and disappear off on their own. However, the top brass was about to be outgunned. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert saw the sense of Scoble's idea and told the War Office to come up with a plan. Not being terribly adventurous or enthusiastic, the civil servants suggested something traditional, an ancient order of some kind, perhaps. This is the document that they prepared. And as you can see from the notes and the squiggles put on it by Prince Albert, he was less than impressed. You can see here he's crossed out this bit where it refers to the order because he didn't want it to be seen like joining a Masonic lodge. Here in the margin, look, he's, he's actually referred to it as a cross granted for distinguished service which will make it simple and intelligible. That is very forward thinking for the time. And here he even suggests a name for it, the Victoria Cross. Nearly a hundred years after Prince Albert wrote those words, Major Robert Kane was preparing to go into battle at Arnhem. He was no career soldier, just an oil company executive from the Isle of Man. So, what sort of chap was he? He was very kind and he had a great sense of humour. I used to drink in the bar. He always bought the drinks. Well, my strongest memory is that you, you hadn't got to be frightened of him that you could go to him and speak to him of anything. I would personally, if I'd been asked to follow anyone, I'd have followed Robert Kane. I had complete confidence in men. The battle plan that brought Kane to Arnhem was called Operation Market Garden, and it was very simple. Allied forces would parachute into Holland and seize a line of strategic bridges. This would create a highway that would allow the Second Army to charge north over the enemy defence lines and down into Germany itself. 
The war, it was said, would be over in a matter of weeks. Now, the most difficult bridge to capture would be the one furthest north, in the Dutch city of Arnhem. But a small band of British paratroopers from the first wave of landings did manage to capture the north end of what's now known as the Bridge Too Far. Major Kane arrived in this field 24 hours after the first landings. There'd been a problem with his glider back in England, but his job remained the same. He had to get his company of 22 men to the bridge as fast as possible to help out. Sounds simple, but it wasn't. First of all, the whole point of airborne troops is surprise. You don't know they're coming until they're there. But because Kane arrived 24 hours after the first wave, the surprise was gone. And to make matters worse, the landing zone was some eight miles from the bridge. So, thanks to some incompetent planning from the top brass in England, the Germans knew that Kane and his men were coming, they knew where he'd landed, they knew where he was going, and they had the wherewithal to do something about it. By sheer coincidence, the German army had parked two divisions just outside Arnhem. That meant tanks, artillery guns, half-tracks and 12,000 SS Panzer troops. Lined up against this wall of armour was the airborne British soldier, who, by the nature of his job, travelled light. He only had a stem gun or rifle, knives, grenades, only a few anti-tank weapons were brought, cos no-one thought they'd be needed. The British troops simply didn't know about the strength of the German opposition as they started out on the eight-mile walk to the bridge. Kane's men made it with no real problems at all to this very spot, just 2,000 yards from the bridge. They could actually see it over there, and they could almost certainly hear the small company of British soldiers fighting to hold on to the northern end, but they couldn't get there. The Germans had had all the time in the world to get ready, and they were ready. Down there, on the other side of the river, they had artillery. On the other side, up there behind that modern building, there's a piece of high ground. They'd put mortars on that. Dead ahead were tanks and infantry. In desperation, some of the British tried to run down this bank, but there were more tanks and more infantry down there on the lower road. This was the perfect place for an ambush. The British had walked right into it, and they were slaughtered. Of the 400 South Staffs who fought here, only a hundred would escape. Kane called it the regiment's Waterloo. Two of his close friends were among the casualties, and in his diary he wrote, for the first time since childhood, tears sprang in my eyes. I turned away, swallowing hard, and with rage in my heart. It must have been a savage kind of rage, because on his way back down this road for more ammunition, he ran into a party of five Germans. And even though he was alone, he opened up with his Bren gun and killed all of them. Later on, the easy-going married father of two wrote of the killings, I cannot describe the surge of dreadful, unholy joy which I felt. When he got back, the battle scenes were horrific. He wrote, We passed Taffy Williams, a grand little Welshman and one of my originals. Only his head and face were untouched. The rest of him was unrecognisable. And so, with his company decimated, Kane was ordered to retreat. He'd bagged five Germans single-handed, but that made him a soldier, not a hero. There was still no hint that this man would win a Victoria Cross. This, the world's ultimate medal, was deliberately designed to be simple. 
In fact, when it was unveiled in 1857, the critics were horrified. The Times called it poor-looking and mean in the extreme. People were used to medals like chandeliers, as big and as glitzy as firework night. It was always assumed that the grander the medal, the brighter it should be. This is the actual prototype of the VC, made to Prince Albert's specifications, a simple cross. Now, when Queen Victoria saw it, she loved it. In fact, if we look on a real one, which I've got here, we can see the only change she made is to the bar. She added some laurel leaves and a little V. And that's it. The highest award for gallantry. Strangely, the metal from which all VCs are made is not kept at the palace or under the Bank of England. It's to be found here, at an army supply base near Telford in Shropshire. It's in these sinister buildings that the army stores its rifles, its machine guns, its artillery pieces, its nuclear and chemical warfare suits. A quarter of a million items with a combined value of £1.4 billion, enough to win a small war. Bear in mind that what you're looking at here is just one aisle, and there are eight aisles in every unit, and there are four units in every building, and there are 20 buildings. The security is fearsome, but even so, the most precious thing they have here is kept in its own safe. A safe with its own alarm and its own all-seeing CCTV camera. This is it. It's a lump of bronze from a Chinese-made cannon that was captured from the Russians at Sevastopol in the Crimean War. And it's from this lump of metal that all Victoria Crosses are made. Now, you'd expect the delicate job of creating a VC to be handled by a household name like Garrard's or Asprey. But no. Every time a new batch of medals is needed, a slice is peeled from the original lump and taken by military escort to a tiny jeweller's in London's Burlington Arcade. Hancock's have made the medal since the day it was created, and it's always given their craftsmen a bit of a headache. It's made of very insignificant, valueless metal. The metal itself is, I suppose the right word is unstable. It, it's not nice metal, like pure copper or pure silver or pure gold or even pure bronze. It, it comes, as most people seem to know, from cannons which were um, captured. So it's already been used once. And the more often you use it, the less stable it becomes. Down in the vaults of this jewellers, you will find seven VCs, the last of a batch that was cast over 30 years ago. They're all unengraved. They're all waiting for an owner. All VCs are going to look alike. But what makes them unique, of course, is the information on the back the engraving of the man's name and regiment and the date. And until they are issued, they are literally valueless. 1942, 3, 4, that sort of time, um, Hancock's were charging £1.10, £1.50 in, in our modern language, to each of the services. And now, a VC which may have cost those sorts of sums in 1943 could well be worth on the market 150 to £200,000.
it does actually become priceless once it's been issued because it can be identified for a particular man on a particular day in a particular action. And it's the history which is carried forward. So, as a piece of jewellery, the Victoria Cross is worthless. But as Queen Victoria understood all along, the medal itself isn't important. It's the story that goes with it that matters. And back in Arnhem, Major Robert Kane's VC story was about to begin. Despite the losses suffered by Kane and the South Staffs in the German ambush earlier that day, the British still saw this as a setback rather than a defeat. And Kane's next task was to come here to a nearby hill called Den Brink. His orders were to seize the hill, hold it, and use the high ground to provide covering fire. Kane made it to the high ground, no problem at all, but he and his men couldn't dig protective trenches because unsurprisingly, the whole area was crisscrossed with tree roots. Look, they're everywhere. And all they had were these pathetic little trenching tools. So they were completely exposed when the tanks came. It was another massacre. Tank shells and mortar fire rained down on Kane's men who couldn't find any protection in the ground. For the second time in a day, he was forced to retreat, writing later, it would have been a sheer waste of life to stay there. I felt extremely dejected. I knew our particular effort to get through to the bridge had been a failure. Kane took a hundred men to the top of that ridge, but when he came down, 90 minutes later, 40 of them were gone. Now, he says he was dejected, but eyewitnesses say he was anything but. They say he was bloody angry. Robert Kane, the affable man who bought the drinks in the bar, had now become an angry warrior. So is anger the fuel which stokes the fire of a VC winner? Many VCs are one. Uh, in the heat of the moment, and undoubtedly the adrenaline uh, gets going and inspires people, but uh, and uh, their emotions will come up to the top, and anger is likely to be one of them because it will. Um, it, they've been seeing their own people being killed, and but I believe very firmly that the a VC winner has complete focus on the job in the hand, and he he may have these emotions, but he's got them under control. Anger without being under control uh, is a useless uh, emotion to have. But anger controlled and directed towards defeating the enemy is a most effective weapon. This man is a classic example. In November 1965, Rambahada Limbu, a lance corporal in the Gurkhas, was fighting in the Indonesian war. During one battle, he ran across 60 yards of open ground, completely exposed to a hail of murderous machine gun fire so he could rescue a wounded soldier. It seemed to onlookers like a suicidal run the first time, but then he did it all over again to come back with a second soldier. And then again for a third time to retrieve their Bren gun, which he used to charge down and kill the enemy. He won his Victoria Cross in just 20 minutes and afterwards said that it was the anger of seeing his friends wounded that had driven him on. Limbu is a rare breed, one of only 15 VC winners who are still alive today. They've all faced death in its most horrendous way, almost obvious way, and they've cheated death, and they don't have to prove anything to anybody. They're, they're at peace with themselves. If anyone can shed light onto the character of a VC winner, it's the secretary to the Victoria Cross and George Cross Association, Didi Graham. She's known more VC winners than anyone else. The principal common quality amongst Victoria Cross holders I've known is an overriding humility and the huge 
inner strength, which doesn't need to show off or throw their weight around in any way at all. Commander Ian Fraser typifies this modesty. In 1945, he and his crew piloted a midget submarine through 80 miles of mined waters in their mission to blow up the Japanese cruiser Takao. In order to sink it, they had to place their explosives right under its keel, but the operation went wrong when the tide went out and the 13,000-tonne cruiser settled onto the tiny submarine, pinning it to the sea bed. When we got stuck and the tide was going out and the cruiser sat down on us, then I really got worried because I wasn't quite sure how I was going to get out because uh, I was still determined to get out the other side. And we sort of went full ahead on the engine and full of stir on the motor, sorry, full ahead on the motor, full of stir. And we dug a trench in the, in the, in the seabed by going backwards and forwards. And eventually we, we came out from underneath it. Fraser and his crew did manage to blow up the cruiser and escape. And it's yet another amazing VC story. But he doesn't see it that way. It always appeared to me that I was doing something that I'd been trained to do. I mean, I'd, I'd worked for months with this team of people that I had in the boat, 12 of them all together, only four in the boat at any one time. And we'd worked for months on attacking ships, sticking limpet mines on things. Then you go and do it in an action, and they give you a VC for doing it. It, it all seemed, uh, it always seems a, bit, seems a bit, um, bit odd to me. I've never come across a Victoria Cross holder who said that they felt that they definitely did earn that award. Another common characteristic is that they all seem to show a sense of responsibility. There's an interesting statistic with the uh, VCs, uh, which is that 75% of them were the responsible child of an early widowed mother or the responsible child in a large family. So it means that they spent the whole of their childhood looking after their siblings or their mother. So they're used to taking, uh, looking after other people and not thinking of themselves. I was feeling probably more for my soldiers than anything else, you know. Uh, uh, I was a, uh, I was just there. I was a secondary, secondary thing to the, to the whole thing. Uh, and, I, and I was uh, upset that I was losing soldiers. Uh, and the enemy was shooting my wounded. In 1969, during the Vietnam War, Warrant Officer Keith Payne was leading a company of trainee soldiers when they were attacked and routed by massively superior Viet Cong forces. Separated from his fellow officers and wounded, Payne went behind enemy lines time and time again to rescue as many of his raw recruits as he could. That night, he saved the lives of 40 men. I felt that it was my responsibility to get my soldiers out of that situation uh, and not ask anybody else to go and do it. So VC winners do seem to have some things in common, a responsibility for others and a temper, perhaps. But does that mean they're all the same? Does that mean there's a type? Well, the truth is it's almost impossible to say. It could be something in the water. There's one street in Canada that's provided us with three winners. It could be something in the blood. Four times it's been won by people whose brothers had already won it, and three times by people whose fathers had already won it. It's been won by rogues, scoundrels, introverts, extroverts, aristocrats. You probably think you don't have it in you to win one, but you probably do. Once people do meet us, we're just ordinary people. They know we're ordinary people and we're, you know, uh, shave and all the rest of the things that uh, people do. Uh, but uh, I think they also recognise the fact that uh, uh, we've been tested and uh, stood up to the test. In Holland in 1944, Major Robert Kane had been tested twice. But worse was to come. This was the picture at Arnhem. 40 miles to the south, the second army, seen here in red, was bogged down. And with reinforcements unable to get through, the men holding the north end of the bridge were soon to surrender. 
Kane and the remaining airborne troops were ordered to pull back three miles west to the village of Osterbeek. A horseshoe of defences was then erected in the hope of holding off the Germans until the Second Army could break through. So, picture the scene. Try to put yourself in the head of someone who was here that day. You were part of the largest airborne assault ever, but your mission has been a complete failure. That's the first thing. You were supposed to have been here two days, but you've been here for four. You landed with 12,000 men, but at this point only 3,900 are left. So it's almost certain that you've watched close friends get killed. You've been fighting pretty much non-stop for those last four days, so it's unlikely you've had any sleep. You've no food. You're low on ammunition. And the Germans have cut off the water supply to the village that you hold up in. And there's no way out of the village because you're surrounded on all sides by tanks and artillery and mortars and flamethrowers and 6,000 German troops. And then someone gets a radio working and you find out that the second army, which was supposed to have been here two days earlier, is still five days away. Imagine how that must have felt, that sense of desolation and isolation, that sense of, well, we're going to die here. To make matters even worse, the RAF was dropping vital supplies of food and ammunition at prearranged landing zones, not realising they'd been overrun by Germans. The British soldiers in Osterbeek actually watched almost 90% of the drops fall into enemy hands. So the Germans must have felt optimistic, but they were reckoning without Robert Kane. His job was to defend the tip of the horseshoe by the river. This was the short straw, because if the Germans came through here, they'd cut everyone off and the Brits would be finished. That night, an eerie silence descended on the bridge. Everyone knew that meant the British holding the North End had finally surrendered, and as a result, the Germans could now turn all their attention to the siege of Osterbeek. What's more, as the British forces grew weaker, the Germans were being reinforced with men and equipment from home, equipment that included their most formidable battle weapon. The Tiger tank was the king of the German divisions, the biggest armoured vehicle they'd ever made. It weighed 57 tonnes. Its armour plating was four inches thick. The shells it fired were from an 88mm gun. It could blow anything to kingdom come with complete impunity. And a herd of them was headed straight for Kane's position. On the second day of the siege, a Tiger tank rumbled down the street at the top of that bank over there. Now, Major Kane was down here on this piece of waste ground, armed with a Piat gun. The British troops hated these things. It was a botched piece of design. It was heavy, it was ungainly, it was inaccurate, and the shell it fired was virtually useless against all known sorts of German armour. And those were the good things about it. The, uh, the bad thing, was trying to cock it. You had to stand on the end like that and then pull it up to tighten the spring, which isn't so bad now because the spring's 60 years old and quite weak. But back then, that would often take two guys. And then, once it was done, you had to seat the shell, which meant feeding it in like this. It's immensely fiddly even today. So what it must have been like when you had 50 tonnes of Tiger tank bearing down on you. And they're thinking about. Kane managed to load the piet by himself and take up position behind a little hut. He waited for the tiger to be 30 yards away, took aim and fired. It was a good shot. The shell went right underneath the tank and blew up, causing no damage whatsoever. All it did was alert the crew inside to the fact that he was there. 
A shell from a tank's 88mm gun blew the hut to smithereens, but at the last second, Kane grabbed his Piat gun and ran for cover past the tank's machine gun to a laundry. And once he got there, he reloaded the Piat and got ready to fire it again. The second shot was as good as the first, but the effect was exactly the same as well. Nothing. So the tank turned its gun again and fired again. And this time it killed Kane's spotter, Lieutenant Ian Meikler. Now, at this point, a sane man would have got out of there. But you've got to remember, Kane had lost a hundred of his men by this stage. He wasn't in the mood for getting out. So, as the dust cleared, no one could quite believe their eyes because he was lying in completely open ground, facing down a tiger tank. I was close enough to see exactly what happened. I think he altered his position to kneeling, and we can see in the distance uh, a tank. I was absolutely certain he, he was going to die there. Kept on shouting, load, load, and firing at the tank. He fired for a third time, and this time, his shell hit the tiger's only Achilles heel. He blew one of its tracks off, immobilising it. And you could see the track of the tank come away and lob on its sides. Kane had no time to celebrate, though, because almost immediately, another tiger rolled into view on the road up there. He dived behind the wall of the laundry again, reloaded his piat again, and then stepped out to take a shot at it. But he pulled the trigger a fraction of a second too soon. So the shell clipped the wall of the laundry and blew up just a few feet in front of his face. There was a flash, and he immediately fell over. And it was horrifying. When I got to him, his face was black, but totally black, and with little pike of spots of blood all the way around. What, 30, 40, 50, whatever it was. And uh, he was saying, I'm blind, I'm blind, I can't see. So several of his men carried him away to the cops, 10, 15 yards away. I stayed with him no more than six or seven paces, I shouldn't think, holding his hand. It seemed like he was finished. But 45 minutes later, he was back. His sight had returned, and that was enough. The shrapnel wounds he would cope with. And this chap came out of the copse with his face blackened. And he got down immediately on the pier gum. I was staggered, utterly staggered. I thought, well, he must be a very brave man to be knocked out, probably, and then come back and take up the same position and still hit tanks. I couldn't understand why such a brave man didn't say, well, I've had enough. He'd done his lot and still kept going and going. But he was still firing when we left. By the end of that day, day two of the siege, Kane, according to eyewitnesses, had destroyed three tanks. No one had ever done that before. He had begun to win his VC. This lump of bronze is only big enough to produce 80 more medals. But there's no need to panic about it running out just yet, because over the years it's become harder and harder to win a Victoria Cross. In the early days, simply whirling your sword at a heathen was often enough, but that changed toward the end of the First World War, and the figures back this up. In World War I, 634 medals were awarded, but in World War II, that dropped to just 182. The bar had been raised to an almost impossible height. During the Arnhem battle, a glider pilot called Lieutenant Mike Dornsey found himself defending a sector very close to where Robert Kane was. Here's the report. Uh, it says the position was continually attacked by superior forces of enemy tanks and infantry. On three occasions, the enemy overran the sector, necessitating a counterattack. 
Dorsey led each sortie with such determination that the positions were regained with heavy loss to the enemy. In the face of heavy small arms and mortar fire, he personally attacked machine gun posts with complete disregard for his own safety. The next day, uh, the Germans attacked again with uh, tanks and self-propelled guns. This time, Dornsey lost the sight of one eye. In spite of the pain, though, he refused to be evacuated. And then on the next day, they came back with tanks again. His men withdrew, and he was left alone, facing down a tank. He threw a gammon bomb through its hatch and blew it up. Now, for this, he was recommended for a VC, but they turned him down. That's how hard it had become to win one. Since the end of the Second World War to the present day, only 11 VCs have been won, and this creates a problem. The fewer VC winners there are, the greater the burden of living in its spotlight. I'd sooner have back with me the pals, my buddies, my comrades back with me, rather than any medal. In 1951, Private William Speakman was part of a battalion of the Black Watch Regiment defending a hilltop in Korea. The hill was attacked by 6,000 Chinese soldiers, and with the Black Watch troops outnumbered by 12 to 1, the situation looked bleak. But as the hill was about to be overrun, Speakman appeared like a 6-foot, 4-inch human grenade launcher. And I thought, well, all this stuff has been done. We pride them. I, I might as well use the bloody things, you know. So uh, that's it. And we went up there and we, we just did it. Ten times he went back for more grenades. And then when they ran out, he lobbed beer bottles and ration tins at the Chinese, anything he could get his hands on. Eventually the attack was broken and Speakman was a hero, but he found it hard to cope with the attention the VC brought. He told one reporter that the medal made him feel like a freak in a freak show. Sometimes it gets a little bit too much. Not sometimes, a lot of the time it gets too much. You, um, people try, try to do something for you. They try to say thank you in their own little way. They say, well, tell me what happened. You, you just, you either don't want to, or you just sometimes you just say, well, no, it's, uh, I've forgotten all about it now. And that's the truth. It's a bit overwhelming for an ordinary person. The difficulty with the Victoria Cross, or an award of that standing being awarded, is you, you were just beginning to get over the shock and the horror of what you've been through. And then you're given this award and you have to relive it all over again, probably for the rest of your life, because people will be asking you about it for the rest of your life. The just incredible people. Uh, I'm being soft about them because they, they were tough men <laughs> that day. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've you know, when I first started um, being involved with the association, there were 450 alive, and now there are only 15. So there's been a lot of sadness. Um, but I've, we've had some incredible times together. The last two VCs, both posthumous, were won in the Falklands War 21 years ago. And the reason it's been such a long time is quite straightforward. Modern warfare with remote control weapon systems arguably separates you from the enemy in a way that hasn't happened in past wars. It gives you an idea of how rarely you can justify a VC and how uh, infrequently the opportunity, and it doesn't need an opportunity, the opportunity to win a VC comes past your door. The days of soldiers sticking their heads above the parapet and taking out half the enemy with nothing but a fruit knife are gone. The days of soldiers like this man, Gurkha rifleman Lackeyman Gurung. In Burma, on May the 13th, 1945, Gurung was manning the most forward post of his platoon when 200 Japanese soldiers attacked the position. Grenades were thrown into his trench, which Rifleman Gurung snatched up and threw back. 
Unfortunately, the third grenade exploded in his hand, blowing off his fingers, shattering his right arm and severely wounding him in the face, body and right leg. For the next four hours, wave after wave of fanatical attacks were thrown in by the enemy and all were repulsed. Even though Gurung, alone in his trench, had to load and fire his rifle using only his left hand. Of the 87 enemy dead counted in the vicinity after the battle, 31 lay in front of Gurung's position. 31. So, is the greatest medal in the world in danger of becoming extinct? Will those seven in the safe at Hancock's jewellers ever be engraved? I think it would be quite wrong uh, to say that uh, there will never be an opportunity for a Victoria Cross to be won in future warfare. There will be opportunities. There will always be personal braveries in an intensive operation, a long drawn out operation, that deserves that reward. There would be certainly plenty in this generation who would be candidates for being awarded the Victoria Cross. Courage isn't lost from mankind. It's just, just the circumstances. Back on the banks of the Rhine, Major Robert Kane was into the third day of the siege of Osterbake and the Germans had changed their tactics. Possibly fed up with losing so many tanks, they decided to batter the British into submission with constant shelling and mortar fire. The Germans by this stage had ringed the British positions with a hundred artillery guns along with 12 of the dreaded Nebelwerfers, multi-barreled mortars which fired six bombs at a time. Somehow this bombardment seemed to inspire Kane, driving him to ever greater feats of bravery. While most of the troops kept their heads down and their fingers crossed, hoping a shell wouldn't land on them, he went in search of tanks. Witnesses spoke of a madman running through a hailstorm of fire in these very streets with his trousers torn off, blood pouring from wounds in his legs, firing his piet at tank after tank after tank. And they said he's falling, the, some were saying he's falling in the pit from the hip, like a bloody cowboy. There was this figure, wounded, bandaged, dirty, dishevelled, but still coming round, still wherever the point of danger was, still encouraging the men all the time. Some were saying he'd knock four, five, six tanks out. Yeah, you can put yourself in the German's position and say, who are this knocking out these tanks must be? <laughs> well... So someone out of this world, I say. In his diary, he says his feet felt like they had a thousand pins sticking in them and that his socks filled with blood. Later in the day, he says he felt something hot and sticky running down the side of his face. Turns out he'd fired so many shells, one of his eardrums had burst. He disregarded his own wounds. He was wounded, seriously wounded and bleeding and, and torn to shreds, yet... Uh, he fought on because that was his duty. He refused to go back for medical treatment until there was a lull in the battle. He fought with a total focus on what he was meant to be doing and many VC holders have this sense of focus. They, they have a focus that sees that it clearly what they've got to do and they must do that regardless of the effect it has on his own life. And this selflessness is perhaps the, mo the key issue in winning a VC. To understand just how important this business of selflessness is, you need to know the story of John Cruikshank. Cruikshank was the captain of a Catalina flying boat, which was very badly shot up during a suicidal attack on a U-boat. Although he sank the U-boat, one of his crew was killed, three others injured, and Cruikshank himself was hit 72 times including wounds to both lungs. So there he is, with his lungs hemorrhaging, slipping in and out of consciousness and barely able to breathe. But he was determined to bring the wounded crew home safely, so he kept the plane in the air for an hour until the sea conditions were safe enough for a landing. And that's an amazing story. 
but it's not as amazing as what the Secretary of State has written here. He says, I think that the VC has been earned in this case, although an element of self-preservation enters into it. And that's the tricky bit. You see, if you're the captain of an aeroplane, you bring it back and therefore save the lives of everyone on board. You also save your own life. You can't really win. Arnhem was a lost cause too. There were so many wounded British soldiers by the fourth day of the siege that the Germans sportingly arranged a ceasefire so they could be evacuated. Kane could have gone. He was a wreck. He was half blind, he was half deaf, his legs were perforated with machine gun and shrapnel wounds. But he chose to stay, and that meant he was still here on the fifth day of the siege. This, in the Germans' eyes, was doomsday, the day when they'd mount their biggest push. They threw everything at the British. Tanks, artillery, flamethrowers, mortars, the lot. The British had arrived in Arnhem with supplies for three days. This was their ninth and the fifth in the hell of Oosterbeek. It was shaping up to be the shortest firefight in history. But Major Kane had other ideas. Kane found himself down by the church, and pretty soon, he was out of ammunition for his Piat, so he switched to a mortar like this. Now, the idea of a mortar is that you jam it into the ground, you drop the shell into the tube, it fires up in the air and lands on the German positions. But the Germans were so close that he was firing it like this, like a normal gun. Now, imagine what that must have looked like from a German's point of view. This Man, with his trousers blown off, caked in blood, with sticky stuff coming down the side of his face, firing a mortar horizontally at you. It must have been unnerving. In Kane's VC citation, it says of the events of that day, by a skillful use of this weapon and his daring leadership of the few men still under his command, he completely demoralised the enemy, who, after an engagement lasting more than three hours, withdrew in disorder. Robert Kane had turned the tide in the battle, and this is another vital factor in winning a Victoria Cross. Your actions have to create a ripple effect. They have to help save the day. On the Monday, it was the final day of the battle, and the Germans, that was 9th SS Panzer Division, had been trying for, since the Friday, to break Major Kane's block, because that was the key to cutting us off from the, the whole division off from the river, and we would have been finished. We all knew that. I mean, it was obvious to us all. But he made sure that they didn't get through, um, to his great credit. His action had tremendous impact on the troops as a whole, and probably uh, helped them keep their resolve and help win the battle out of proportion to the size of his own personal command. It was the most wonderful example to everyone. A major firing at tanks is, is something you don't hear of, really. We all wanted to emulate him, of course, um, which we tried to do to our best ability. The, the effect that uh, Major Robert Kane had on the men was obviously his leadership and the fact that they were on the defensive but he was moving, he was showing himself, he was rallying where there was the greatest danger. And that has the most huge impact upon people who have just got to stay there and endure and be brave. They need something to focus upon. He was that focus. He led by example completely. I mean, I'm sure that whoever got back over that river of the South Staffords could owe that fact to Bob Kane. Nobody else, because it was his example that rallied them. His bravery was suicidal and utterly selfless. His tank-killing antics rallied the troops, beat off the enemy and helped keep the defences at Osterbeek intact. These were the reasons why this man won a Victoria Cross. And not just any VC either. 
According to his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Derek McCarty, it was the finest Victoria Cross of the whole war. After the Germans withdrew, the British, out of ammo, food and ideas, and knowing by this stage that the Second Army wasn't coming, silently crossed the river at night to safety. Kane knew they were retreating, but he didn't want to look beaten. When they were in utter defeat by the river, withdrawing over the river, the battle was lost. He found a razor and somehow he shaved so that at least he would go back looking respectable and like an officer above his men. Amazing man. Kane was awarded his Victoria Cross at Buckingham Palace on the 2nd of November, 1944, the first Manxman ever to get one. But like many other VC winners, he was never very comfortable with all the ballyhoo and fuss. Kane was the only one of five VC winners at Arnhem who lived to tell the tale. Not that he would tell the tale, of course. VC winners rarely do. And that's a pity, because Kane's tale is one of how many more young men, how many more teenage soldiers might have died had he not fought quite so ferociously. After the war, he left the army and went back to working for Shell in Nigeria and the Far East. He died of cancer in 1974. Sadly, that meant I never met him, which is a shame for two reasons. Firstly, because I'm absolutely fascinated by VC winners. And secondly, because I'm married to his daughter. She didn't even know he'd won a Victoria Cross until after he died. He never thought to mention it. You know, we've a rather warped sense of what constitutes bravery these days. I mean, even David Beckham is called a hero for scoring a penalty. But when you look at VC winners and hear their stories, well, enough said. <laughs>